Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I welcome all the viewers to the 15th Vyakhyan in the series of 75 uh, Vyakhyan or lectures being organized by the Physical Research Laboratory. As you are aware, we are celebrating the 75th uh, anniversary of the foundation of PRL this year. And to mark this occasion, we are organizing PRL Ka Amrit Vyakhyan series, uh, which commenced from 4th of August. Uh, the Vyakhyan is scheduled every Wednesday at 4 p.m. And in this Vyakhyan series or Vyakhyan Mala, we invite eminent speakers in different fields of science, arts, business, engineering, literature, uh, both from India as well as abroad. Uh, today's lecture is indeed very special and is being organized to celebrate the Foundation Day of PRL, which falls on 11th November, that is tomorrow. Uh, PRL, as you all know, was founded in 1947 by Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, a distinguished cosmic ray and uh, space scientist who came to be known as the father of uh, space program in India. On behalf of the director PRL and my colleagues, and also on behalf of the Amrit Vyakhyan Committee of PRL, I extend a very warm welcome uh, to Sri Sanjay Lalbhai, the estimated, esteemed speaker of today's Vyakhyan, who is the chairman and managing director, director of Arvind Limited, and also a member of the Council of Management of PRL. On this uh, glorious occasion, uh, we are very honored and privileged that Sri Sanjay Lal Bhai will be delivering the Vyakhyan on a very interesting, interesting topic. And I think it's going to be very inspiring to hear him on business journey and learnings on the way. Uh, thanks, Sri Sanjay Lal Bhai, for your gracious presence in our celebrations of PRL at 75. Once again, I congratulate all my PRL colleagues for the 75th anniversary of our Foundation Day. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Professor Anil Bharadwaj, Director PRL, uh, to formally introduce Sri Sanjay Lalbhai to the audience and to invite him to deliver the 15th Vyakhyan in the Amrit Vyakhyan Mala. Professor Bharadwaj, please. Thank you, Professor Nandita. And uh, welcome to everyone to this uh, 15th episode of uh, PRL Ka Amrit Jackchan. It's indeed uh, a great privilege for all of us uh, that one of our council member of uh, PRL Council of Management, Sri Sanjay Lal Bhai, is with us today as the Vyakhyan Karta. Uh, and it is also a great occasion because uh, uh, it is close to the foundation day of PRL, which is on 11th of November, that is tomorrow. And we are celebrating that uh, day as Kids Day at PRL. So we are calling the children of uh, all the employees of PRL to PRL tomorrow for having a day at PRL and to enjoy the PRL, to learn about PRL and to cherish the PRL. Well, about uh, Sanjay Lal Bhai, of course, uh, in addition to his uh, distinction as the chairman and managing director of Arvind Limited, which is a $1.5 billion uh, business uh, conglomerate. Uh, he is the one uh, who has uh, taken the Arvind Mills to a very great heights uh, as uh, becoming one of the largest manufacturers of the woven textiles in India. Uh, it is a uh, what you call a long history of uh, textiles uh, in his family, which has been the business. And uh, he has taken the lead in taking it forward to make it uh, uh, worldwide. He is also responsible for acquiring the India's first uh, denim brand flying machine in 1981 itself. So it's almost 30 years back and uh, for guiding the process of building Arvind's uh, current impressive apparel brand portfolios. He also serves on the board of uh, several premier educational and research institutes, including of course PRN. He is the president of uh, Ahmedabad Educational Society and Ahmedabad University, and uh, the chairman of uh, the Council of Administrators of Ahmedabad Textile Industry Research Association, that is ATIA. Uh, he's also the president of uh, CEPT industry. And uh, uh, Sanjay Lalbhai believes that addressing societal concerns and creating long lasting benefits 
to society is integral to the business strategy and a duty of every business leader. He provides uh, strategic leadership to Arvind's uh, uh, CSR, that is uh, social responsibility of corporates. Uh, initiatives uh, as a trustee to Shraddha Trust, which is a, a CSR arm of the company. Uh, Sanjay Bhai uh, has two sons, Puneet and Kunil, and this is the fifth generation of uh, uh, textile family, and they are carrying forward the legacy of uh, their father and forefathers. So with this, uh, I will request now Sanjay Bhai to be with us for next uh, 45 minutes and deliver his vacation on business journey and learnings on the business. Sanjay Bhai. Thank you, Dr. Bhardwaj. I think it's a great initiative by PRL. Uh, RTS, congratulations for completing 75 years. Dr. Vikram Sarabhai was my uncle. Uh, he used to visit us almost every week along with my grandfather. I think they have built some iconic institutions and founded some of the best institutions in Ahmedabad from IIM to PRL to Ahmedabad Education Society is responsible for almost all the higher education institutions in Ahmedabad. So the list is endless. And I think um, I had the privilege as a young person to uh, know Dr. Sarabhai very well. Um, my aunt was married to his uh, brother, so we knew the family very well. Uh, they were family friends. We had a common compound wall uh, between Sarabhais and Lalbais. So uh, we have known, the two families have known each other for generations. And uh, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai was a visionary and a brilliant leader. I think uh, to just sum up, uh, I think the people who he had taken as trainees have ended up becoming chairman of all the major research institutions. And even our president <laughs> was one of the persons who was selected by Vikram Kaka. So what a visionary, you know, I mean, not that he changed the landscape of uh, our space research in this country, but he was an industrial industrialist par excellence and a phenomenal human being. Modest, very humane. He used to come and <clears throat> his first interaction at my place was he would sit down with my bhaiyaji who was operating our telephone and talk to him one to one with his first name, sitting along with him. So he had a range to talk to uh, our domestic health to president, chairmen, prime ministers, and who not. You know, that shows the greatness of this gentleman. And it was not an act. It was coming all from the heart. So everyone loved him. And uh, this great institution is testimony to his vision and his foresight. Having said that, let me attempt the topic on hand. Uh, uh, I think I'll just uh, share some of my experiences and more than my experiences, I think what I have learned and what I've learned would be applicable to, I think, everyone. And uh, I hope that it is useful. So I am a major, I, I did my BSc in statistics and maths from Xavier uh, in Ahmedabad. And then I did my MMS, Masters in Management Studies from Jamnalal Institute of Management, Mumbai. So once I completed my MMS, I came back to family business and I was given a sick company to turn around, Anil Forgings. So it was a very small company in the group, the only company which was not doing well. And I was lucky enough to be given a sick company to turn around. Because one of the learnings is that when you are given responsibility, you learn very quickly. If you go into a very large organization and you grow gradually, functionally, it will take you a long time to understand the ropes of business. 
but when you have a small sick company to turn around you don't have much time the company is financially unwell so it is like a patient in icu you cannot <laughs> spend too much time otherwise the patient will die so you are not given time you have to understand things very quickly and then you have to execute a plan and you have to understand what are the pain points and come up with a strategy which would solve these pain points and put back the company into financial health so this was a very interesting assignment and i would say that most of my learnings happened in those first one or two years because i was thrown into the fire straight from the college without any kind of previous experience um another thing what i have learned is when you are when you join a sick company the good thing is people are willing to change change is a constant as we all know you know if you do not change constantly you will die this is a law of nature but human beings are very scared of change because we are all comfortable in in doing what we are used to doing whenever someone asks us to change that means you are going into a uncertain terrain and no human being likes uncertainty and that's why we always find change being resisted but in a sick company people know that they have no other option but to do something different so it's a great thing that people are willing to change but you have to come up with a clear vision clear direction and then you have to work as a team the people are more willing to look at a new vision but the vision has to be compelling and backed up by data and a proper direction so i learned a lot in this first uh, assignment another learning was that when almost the company got turned around i had labor problems and it was a very militant labor uh, and i was all of 25 years old and i was working in a sick company where the head the ceo was almost 65 years old and i had to work with him i had to have the modesty to 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 understand that he spent his entire life here so win over his confidence and change bring in change which was required but having done all that to have a labor problem and that to a militant labor force was a great learning to extreme adversity even to the extent that i was physically threatened i had to continue and you had to have the will power the staying power and the conviction that i am not going to back down by coercion or by threats i will be most willing for a dialogue but i am not open under pressure or threat so this was a great learning this was and finally i could convince this militant labor that i am most willing to understand the problem and threats and strike is not a solution but a proper dialogue uh, of what the problem is and trying to you also trying to understand the problem of the company because if we don't all come together to understand the problem of the company the company will die then there is no nothing for anyone so finally we could resolve the labor problem and the company was on the course of uh, you know a healthier future after doing this my first assignment i was shifted in the most prominent company of the family we had almost nine listed companies at that time seven textile composite mills listed on the stock exchange atul limited which is one of the largest dyes and chemicals and agro chemical and uh, uh, company in india today and uh, anil starch unfortunately anil starch has closed down um, but at that time anil forging was part of anil starch so we had nine listed companies uh, at that time and i was shifted to arvin limited so i joined arvin limited in 1979 uh, 
after two years of my starting my business career. Here, I had a completely a different uh, uh, kind of scenario. First two years I spent in a sick company where people were very receptive and change was possible. Here I joined a company which was formed in 1931 and from very beginning 1931 it had never made a loss from the year one it had made profit and it had distributed dividend so it had never seen failure it had never seen a problem in so many years from 1931 to 1979 so there were people there was family of course my two uncles were there then there was a very strong uh, uh, ceo manubai shah very capable gentleman and then there were too many very powerful functional heads all from ima at that time so very clever people very capable people managing arvind limited and i was a young trainee who had joined so i was given a portfolio i was given uh, materials management as a function because when you go to a large company you cannot be asked to you have to go up the hierarchy you have to learn uh, function by function and then if you perform then you would be given more responsibility but when i joined this company i realized that there was a threat from power looms there were 76 uh, successful textile companies in ahmedabad ahmedabad was called the manchester of india and the entire economy of Ahmedabad was thriving and flourishing because of the textile companies doing very well. They used to employ 1.5 million workers. So the entire economy of Ahmedabad was in a way intricately linked to the success of this entire textile sector. Unfortunately, because of the threat of power looms, which was an unorganized sector, they started flourishing and they were very competitive and they were working outside the framework of government laws and policies. So they had a, a unfair advantage compared to a composite or a, a formal uh, format of the industry. Uh, but the Power loom started employing many people, and as a result, in a democracy, it was impossible to stop them. So one by one, the all these successful companies started closing down because they were not able to compete with the power looms. And I saw the writing on the wall that even Arvind and the other six group companies, which had also not seen any kind of failure for a very long period of time cannot compete with the power looms because the products we were making power looms were making it at a much cheaper rate and some of the trained managers who had worked with all of us had gone out and started these uh, their own enterprises and they were much more competitive now the problem was how do you tell very capable, very senior people. And I had come with only two years of experience. How do you convince them that we are now threatened and our existence is in question? You know, no one would even be willing to have a dialogue because they would say that, what do you know? You have just come out of a fresh college. We have successfully managed this company for more than 50 years and we have never lost money. So it was a big challenge to, to, to convince anyone in Arvind that we are going to, we have a survival issue and we will just fold up if we don't do something different. Finally, my uncle was also a visionary, Arvind Narottam Lalbhai. And I told Arvind Kaka that please let me do something different. I'll do a very small pilot facility so it will not do anything major harm to Arvin but I believe that if I can do something different and not what power looms are doing if I can bring in technological difference product difference and I can make something which is in tune with the new generation 
then possibly we will survive this onslaught from the power loads. And this is how I strategized with Dr. Mote from IIMA. I went to him. He was the only uh, kind of uh, professor who was in strategy and who was very familiar with textile industry. So I engaged. I told him that I personally feel that the existence of our company is at, in, in, in danger. And uh, I would very much want him to help me strategize and find a solution. So he readily agreed and I formed a small team of uh, these kind of very capable minds and we all sat down and strategized and we came up with an idea that let us manufacture something like denim which was never manufactured in India before but denim was universally accepted product. Denim and jeans was prevalent in every country, every, every ethnicity from Muslim countries to communist countries to democracies, everyone wore, wore denim. Of course, denim was only starting in Bollywood and our actors were wearing jeans at that time, not too many, and the youngsters, because that was the generation of Beatles and rock music. So I was introduced to denim, but uh, only our generation was introduced to, and the Bollywood. So we thought that uh, we should bring this product, which is a universal product to this country. And this is so much, so such different technology that power loom threat is not going to be there. And if this product gets accepted and we can manufacture it properly, then hopefully we will be able to grow this business profitably because we have the pricing power and we will not be threatened by power. So I put up a very small facility of 3 million meters per annum. That is the smallest capacity possible. So we started. I had a brilliant uh, research and development team, uh, again started by Arvin Kaka. But I selected one gentleman called Dr. Roy. He was not the head of R&D, but he was a research uh, enthusiast. And he was always working on new cutting edge uh, technologies. So with Dr. Roy, Dr. Mote and a small team, we embarked on the journey to manufacture denim. So we selected all the new machines. We set up this 3 million meters capacity plant. And as luck would have it, from day one, we could establish the quality. So our product came out right. And as the luck would have it, the denim went through a huge surge because a new wash called stone wash. It was stone wash and beetles started wearing it. And beetles were a rage, the rock, rock band, uh, beetles. So all the four uh, beetles wore um, uh, this stone washed denim. So denim became such a rage that people from all over the world came to, to <laughs> asked for denim from Arvind at that time. So it, it, it is not that I succeeded, but all the things came together. We had a good thought about a futuristic product which would, which would have a connect with the new generation, with Bollywood. Because Bollywood was wearing it, the younger generation was definitely going to wear it. And uh, it became a global rage and I was lucky. Uh, so this worked and this helped us survive the onslaught by power rooms. So as you know today, out of those 75 composite mills, Arvind is the only surviving company. All of them closed, including the six other textile mills of our group, because they could not change. They could not reinvent themselves. They were too afraid to change. And they believed that government will do something. Government will not allow this uh, illogical, illegal pro uh, prolification of power looms. And some of the other, that's why we will survive. But it was a wishful thinking because there were millions of people getting employed, workers getting employed in power loom. And no democracy would close down something which was giving so much employment. So again, the learning is that you have to reinvent. 
you cannot depend on success and because you have been successful for let's say 50 years does not give you a guarantee that you will be successful for another 30 years you may be most efficient you may be very well managed but if your business product life cycle has come to an end with the best of efficiency you will not survive because someone was doing that at a much better cost so you would not survive and you had to admit that you had have to have the courage to start changing yourself before it is too late because once you come into a cash flow or a financial problem then you are just fighting for survival because you are just managing your cash but when you your cash flow is not very bad if you come out with a new idea and that idea has to succeed so i was lucky i'm not wanting to take credit uh, and i always believe that another thing i believe is that all successful people have a clear vision they are very very focused they are hard working and they are passionate about what they are doing but that does not guarantee success success also comes because of various other things and luck has a luck is misunderstood luck means uh, let's say prob probability statistical probability that things will work out like a stone wash uh, giving a great uh, boom to jeans is a lucky break i mean it was not planned like no one could have uh, thought about it correct so all these things have to come together for something to work out and then we built very quickly from 3 million to almost 100 million meters capacity in a very short period of time and arvin became an iconic uh, name so from a sunset business where almost 1 and 1/2 million workers lost uh, jobs we talked about renovation we saw that where you don't see opportunity we see opportunity so we positioned arvin as a sunrise industry and not a sunset industry with renovation we called it renovation not modernization renovation a new vision and uh, we built this uh, into an iconic global business rather than a domestic business uh, very quickly so the learnings are as i have shared with you that change is constant you have to have the courage to change and reinvent whatever you are doing even in your personal professional uh, career unless you are constantly learning and reinventing yourself you will become obsolete and even in today's age and time i think every week things are changing correct so by the time you graduate i jokingly tell my student that whatever you have learned is now broadly obsolete the broad principles work but you will have to what we have taught you is how to learn and learning has to be a constant habit learning is not when you are only for four years with us in the college we teach you how to learn constantly so learning has to be a constant change has to be a constant unless you are reinventing yourself constantly as an individual or as an organization you will not survive so this is one of the life lessons i thought i will i will share with you with this success i must admit that there was a little bit of overconfidence bordering on arrogance crept into our team and we started growing we put up the largest shirting plant we put up the largest knitting plant we put up the largest uh, khaki gabardine plant dockers uh, the biggest uh, casual wear brand by levis was a rage at that time so we put up all these verticals simultaneously and at a huge capex of 1000 crores at one go uh, and that was a big mistake because uh, what i realized is that the vision was right but we had no clue of how to execute such complex uh, so many new businesses simultaneously and as a result from the heights of glory and success came a very humbling situation where we risked the entire company again we went into a debt trap and we were again 
fighting for survival. This is in, we started denim sometime in 1985 and from 85 to 97, Arvind had the best time of growth and success. And come 97, when we put up all these businesses, we starting from 95, we went into one of the biggest debt traps. And uh, again, our existence was, was in question. And this time, uh, it was all because of me. Because I have to take all the blame. Because I was the leader. So I admit that it was my mistake. It could have been a collective, uh, um, you know, plan or strategy to implement so many things together. But other learning is that whenever something goes wrong, the leader has to take the blame. Whenever something succeeds, leader has to share. Leader has to go into the background and say that the success is because of the team. But when something goes wrong, a good leader will shield his, his people and say, it is me who is at fault. And he should be the one to take all the pressure. So I did accept my mistake. I had 86 uh, bankers, very aggrieved bankers. The bankers who were, uh, you know, treating me very differently, treating me very differently. <laughs> uh, suddenly, I was sitting outside their, their uh, offices for hours and then I was called in, given a very tough message, uh, humiliated in uh, many ways. And I accepted that because I said, uh, you have all the right. Uh, you have given me money and I am not able to repay the money. So what you are saying is right. Uh, and these were great friends. Uh, but now I had put them in difficulty. So I had to accept all the humiliation and all the uh, kind of hard talk which was given to me. And uh, I said, listen, uh, this is a mistake. Uh, of course, there were a lot of circumstances which were also not going right, which resulted into all this thing. Uh, uh, denim went down. We had floods and our project got delayed. So we had a lot of calamities. But you can always blame everything else. You know, People have no time for it. When you fail, you have to understand that you will have to accept the blame. Correct. You can explain it away. I had unforeseen this and I had unforeseen that and this went wrong. Okay, people will sympathize. Correct. But finally, now you have defaulted and, and, and we, we sympathize that you had a bad run as you had a good run uh, in, uh, in 85. You had a bad run now. But why did you take so much risk. Your risk management was not right. Why did you leverage your balance sheet so much? I mean, you should have been cautious. You should have funded your projects more with equity rather than loans. Then if something could have gone wrong, you had enough time and cash flows to manage that. So I was to be blamed and I took the blame. I said, listen, uh, I'm willing to mortgage and, and give everything. If you think my leadership is not right, I'm willing to step down. If you think I gave them a very clear plan as to how I will turn it around. But I said that I will need time, patience and restructuring. So 86 bankers and some of the most powerful bankers from all over the world. Correct? Two of them prosecuted me and uh, but luckily most of them agreed and I put in everything I had personally. So I said, listen, I am giving all that I have into this company because I believe this company can be turned around. And this is the situation and I, I accepted my mistake and I accepted that these things have gone wrong and this is the plan to put it right. So it was one of the largest restructuring in the history of Indian private sector. And uh, it took us five years from 97 to 2002 to restructure early, but we got it restructured. And uh, Luckily for me, uh, the majority of the bankers uh, helped me restructure the company. And by 2002, we were back in running and uh, we were financially okay. And we were able to uh, pay, pay back 
all our dues uh, uh, and we again became healthy. So here the learning is that I realized that all the mistakes, success rarely teaches you anything. The biggest mistakes are made when you are very successful. Because a successful person broadly loses humility. And he starts believing that in most of the cases he's right. And these are the biggest mistakes. Any leader who stops listening, any leader who does not like dissent, who doesn't like to be told that you are making a mistake, or who does not like an alternative plan, or who does not like to be questioned, is going to fail. And success does all these things to successful people. So my learning is that when you succeed, you should become more humble. You should not take personal credit. You should be most willing to listen to people. Correct. And you should be aware that if you get carried away by your success and the attributes which have given you success, then you are likely to make the biggest mistakes in your life. You know, when a mango tree grows mangoes, it, 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 it becomes, you know, it, 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 uh, its branches come down. So it is a sign of, you know, so human being, when it, he succeeds, he should become open and humble. And every successful person should know that success comes because of various things and not only his ability. So he should remain humble, open, and he should be very aware that some of the successful traits of hardworking, never say die, passion, correct, good governance, excellent execution, all this he has to carry forward. But the circumstances which have made him successful may not repeat. So there is a slight difference. Success, certain traits you can continue. But the, the formula which has made you successful may not work the next time over. So this is a big learning for everyone that you have to constantly remain open. You have to constantly be willing to be questioned and you should encourage dissent and diverse opinions. Success should not give you or you should not become arrogant or you should not start believing in yourself too much. So this is the learning. Then again, I had to reimagine re Arvind because Denim, there were now 45 people competing with us. So we have to constantly reinvent. So we reinvented, we went into advanced material division, technical textiles, because we realized that uh, there is no competition in technical textiles. And technical textiles are required in a growing economy. What do, we, what, do, what do I mean by technical textiles? Those are uh, related to textile as an application, but the end uses are completely different. So like uh, all protective textiles, fire retardant fabrics, bulletproof jackets, these are all technical textiles. Geo textiles, it's technical textiles, correct? Uh, so there are around 10 different disciplines in technical textiles. So Arvind branched out into technical textiles. We went into composite materials. So where you bring glass and carbon as a fiber, you weave it and then you make different end products for aerospace, for automobiles, for windmills and various end applications. So we went into composite materials. We went into industrial fabrics. So the belting fabrics for filtration, for all kinds of belts for conveyors and things like that. We went into air filtration and water filtration fabrics. Uh, so we have diversified and we went into uh, human protection. So all fire retardant and those kind of pro products. So again, we, we are constantly reinventing ourselves. We are not saying that denim saved us at that time. But denim today is a very competitive product. So in denim also we have uh, you know, reinvented ourselves. We have gone into uh, not only jeans, but we have gone into PK polos because today, after COVID, everyone is wearing, uh, you know, T-shirts. 
because you are always at home. So athleisure and sportswear is the new rage. Uh, sleepwear is the new rage. You know, people are wearing more casual clothes. No one is go. No one was for two years going to the office. So everyone was dressing down. So you have to again reimagine and come up with new products which are in uh, in sync with the consumer's behavior or their requirements. So the other learning is that uh, you cannot sit on your laurels. You have to constantly reinvent and figure out as to for the next 10 years, what products, what technologies, what uh, kind of attributes of your products will synergize with the customer requirements. So we are growing, we came up with uh, advanced material, we went into a complete solution. So we have done garmenting also. So we start with uh, uh, cotton and we give full pair of jeans to Levi's. So we have become a solution provider, one-stop shop. Uh, so we are doing the full thing now. So we have verticalized our business. We have gone into more casual wear, which is knits and uh, casual clothing, which is in sync with uh, the new generation. The new generation is dressing down. They are not wearing so many formal clothes. So again, Arvind is reinventing itself. The other pillars on which we are reinventing is sustainability. Because one of the biggest problems facing all of us today is the is the uh, you know global warming and it is a real problem as we know we have only one place to live on which is earth till we all of you help us go to moon and habitat uh, habitat uh, mars i'm sure you will work very hard along with elon musk and of course india will is already a leader i think only china uh, america uh, india and i don't know one more country is as as uh, the kind of space, uh, um, uh, you know, leadership. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, we will uh, have our own indigenous uh, 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 spacecraft to help us uh, uh, go to Mars and create a habitation <laughs> which is which is other than Earth because we have only uh, one one place today. <laughs> and if something goes wrong with this, uh, the whole human humanity is at risk. Um, so uh, coming back to this, sustainability is very important. Uh, so Arvind is working on a complete matrix of sustainability. So from organic cotton to no water from groundwater. So we are using municipal wastewater. We are treating it. Then we are do doing zero discharge. So we are doing primary treatment, secondary treatment, reverse osmosis and desalination. So we are the high TDS water we are desalinating so it is a zero discharge and almost 92 percent of the water is recycled so we are taking no groundwater at all now we are coming out with new technologies we don't require any kind of water in its uh, production so denim or a pair of jeans use up uses up 80 liters of water i mean it is one of the most uh, water consuming products now today we have come out with something which has come down to 10 liters and I think going forward, we want to use no water at all in making a pair of jeans. So this is the way technologies are evolving. This is the way we would like to go forward. In sustainability, we have also made almost 40% of our entire energy. We are taking uh, uh, solar and uh, wind energy. And uh, today there is a constraint of only using 40%. We are telling the government that all our customers like H&M, uh, Zara, uh, CNA and GAP have pledged that they will become zero carbon or zero carbon companies by 2030 and they cannot use or allow us to use any fossil fuel. So or our steam will cannot be generated out of coal. We will have to generate it through biomass, agricultural biomass uh, or any kind of other other products which can be used which are not uh, uh, fossil fuel based. And we'll have to use energy or power, which is all renewable. So Arvind will be using no water, renewable power, all our steam and everything will be made out of biomass. So it is a complete shift from what we are doing into a completely aligned future with our customers, which is completely sustainable. Uh, again, as I was saying, 
that to survive in a very competitive world, you have to constantly come out with innovative products. You have to become sustainable. You have to come out with technologies which are next generation, which will not use water and power to that extent. Uh, and the biggest change now I'm seeing is that with the onset of online as the major channel of consumption, like now all the youngsters are buying their apparel and clothing online. So what are they looking for? They are looking for good price and they are looking for varieties. They don't want to look at one design and buy. They want to look at thousands of designs and buy what is unique. And they also don't want something which is bought by somebody else. So they want a unique identity for themselves. So Arvind is gearing itself with technologies which can produce something just in time. So let me give you an example that suppose a brand, we own brands. So let's say Rough and Tough or Newport puts in 2000 different designs online. Then within a week, we know which are the designs which are selling and which are the designs which are not selling. Usually what happens today is that we put designs, but we put only 70 designs. Uh, and then the turnaround time is almost six months. So my designers would order the fabrics depending on next season's uh, collection, which they think would be the thing which people will like. Of course, based on analytics and what is sold in the last season, 70% of that repeats. So there is a science of predicting this. But the cycle is six months old. But tomorrow's world is going to dramatically transform itself. Tomorrow's world is going to be that I introduce 1,000 designs and the designs which sell, I'll get to know it because everything is on uh, instant. Uh, I'm completely connected. So I know in real time what is selling, what is not selling. Um, the 100 designs which sell, I want to only buy those. And I don't want to buy the, the 900 which are not selling. So can I now come up with a supply chain solution which is only producing what is selling. So what Arvind is doing is platforming garments. So I'll give you an example. A round neck tee, t-shirt. Suppose you have it in six colors. Those are the six colors which are moving. Then we have worked on a technology which will print on a ready garment of these six colors. So you will differentiate and I can give you one design of your liking. So I can put up 10,000 designs on uh, my portal. You go and click, I will print that. And in the same day, I can ship it out to you. So it is instant gratification. It is a unique product given to you and just in time. So there is no redundancy. There is no, no, no way that, you know, I have to produce something which is not selling. So this is the world of tomorrow. And we are working very hard to work out, we are calling it smart textiles. So how do I produce what sells? And this is what I believe. Again, this is, I'm, I'm going a couple of years. I don't know when this will happen. It has all started when it will totally go towards it. Of course, major technological changes have to also come into play for this to happen. But this is what we are working on. So. I'm giving you an example that unless you are reinventing yourself, unless you are looking at the uh, future differently, unless you are understanding the new customer, what is he looking for? And unless you are adopting technologies, systems, processes, uh, software, analytics, big data, in a way, correct, uh, that which provides this kind of service or this kind of a solution, you will not survive. We have seen so many iconic companies just go out of business. What has happened to records? What has happened to, uh, you know, uh, now all the music is being streamed. What has happened to CDs? What I mean, you can think of hundreds of products, correct? Which are just now, what has happened to Kodak? I mean, these were iconic com companies. Now everything is digitized. Correct? They are all gone. Those products are obsolete. Now what do I do with a very nice textile machinery and very efficient plant 
if everyone wants smart textiles that 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 machinery is not capable of producing smart textiles so if i am not changed i will die correct i may be very efficient at making denim but people don't want denim the way it is being made the new next way of making denim would have changed so what i am trying to say is that the world is changing so rapidly that unless you adapt correct right? and all these technologies are converging so a guy like me you know unless i adopt and work with some of the best minds in ai big data analytics supply chain logistics technology innovation all these people have to come together to solve this very complex problem if i have to come out with machinery solutions which can do instant supply chain or supply products which are selling in 7 days then i have to uh, you know work with the machinery manufacturers and co develop a solution the solution does not i mean there are there is and i have to appraise the machinery manufacturer that my friend what you are manufacturing is not in demand correct you will have to come up with us we both will have to come up with a solution which meets with this online or this new generations requirements of instant gratification unique product correct and at a competitive price so this is how the world is evolving this is how the world is dramatically changing sustainability all new technologies even ai now you know all data which we get from our customers we are analyzing the behavior of our customer and we are able to second guess a customer that if you are my customer i know your personality i i i know so many things about you that i know what to show you correct so when i am i am i am showing something to you i i have to be intelligent enough to know what you would like and that data is with me now this is the power of data correct so i was talking to mukesh ambani and he said sanjay the next oil is big data now this is true correct data is i mean you look at the biggest companies today in the world what do they have they have data and they are completely changing uh, coming out with new technologies to provide you solutions and services which are absolutely uh, you know different than what they were uh, so i mean i was just reading that facebook is going to call itself metaverse so it is a whole di digital universe it is it is an avatar where people will exist all the things will be the digital world you know you will own a building which is digital you will own a painting which is digital you will be <laughs> through blockchain you will be owning things and controlling it cryptocurrencies are working so just look at the world i mean you know i mean what is going to remain valid what is going to become obsolete i mean we are all aware that how the world is changing you know every week a new unicorn is getting born in india and they are offering completely a different solution and a service correct what is happening to cars and automobiles correct all the giants like uh, tesla is is creating hell for all the established what has happened to toyota you know an iconic leader in automobile for so many years and i am reading articles on youtube that bmw may just fold up now can you imagine a company like bmw not existing they are excellent at what they are doing but a new startup can create hell now i don't know what ola is going to do to the scooter industry in india correct because they are uh, a, a a startup they will gain market share they will burn money they will not worry about profits they will go on on technology correct they'll give you uh, uh, completely a different financial package they'll come out with next generation of technology they have nothing to lose they don't have uh, the past baggage of of uh, petrol based <laughs> uh manufacturing setup so they are only investing in the next generation of resources so it is a very scary world that you may be the most powerful zero debt 
uh, best run company, but your uh, life cycle of your product may have come to an end and a new startup will kill you. And it's a reality. So you will have to understand this. You will have to accept this, correct? I mean, a guy like this, NASA. Now, Elon Musk is sending more rockets than NASA. He has a vision of putting humanity onto Mars, whilst NASA has still not talked about it. He's burned so much money in, 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 in you know, uh, creating a completely a new technology, more efficient technology to, to send rockets into space and bringing them back. So uh, what I'm saying is that any field you can think of, any field at all, there is disruption and there is huge amount of innovation. And there are brilliant people now, the best minds are, are getting backed by patient money. So it doesn't have to work for either a Lalbhai or anybody. He has, Lalbhai invest into that idea. That is how the whole world is going to evolve. So the world is changing very rapidly. What I said in my journey, uh, what I have gone through every 10 years, 15 years, major upheavals in my career is now happening every month. So the speed has just gone completely crazy. And if you do not understand as to, you need not say that I, my competitor is a very capable, another composite textile mill. It could be a startup. It could be a st smart textile mill started by two IITians who will just, just finish you off, correct? So this is how the world is moving. This is what is happening. And the learning is this, that unless you are constantly changing, unless you appraise yourself of the requirement and many a times you create a new product like this metaverse, even a customer would not know what to be, correct? You are creating a product and suddenly you, you see that everyone is gravitating towards it. So the world is, is changing at a pace which is mind boggling. So what are the learnings? Please constantly reinvent yourself. Keep yourself appraised. Surround yourself with the best minds. Constantly network and work with universities, best uh, research institutions, correct? Best individuals uh, having thought processes, best new ideas. It may not be uh, an idea which may be relevant to your industry, but tomorrow it could be, or you can make it relevant to your industry. So today, the requirement of a leader is to know everything about the world. Today, it is not a simple thing that I'm a textile man. I know how to run a textile discipline well, correct? I'll have to know sustainability. Now, if I have to know sustainability, I have to know how not to use water. I have to know how to become zero carbon footprint. I have to know the renewable power. I have to know so many other things, correct? I have to know financial modeling. I have to know cutting edge technologies. So it is not one discipline. And that's why I must congratulate you that you are calling uh, so many diverse people to talk to, talk to your, your group. Uh, because, uh, you know, what I'm saying is that the world is now going to be one problem, requires multi disciplines to come together to solve a problem or we can learn from each other, correct? What you are doing, I can learn something from you and make it applicable to what I'm doing or it may open my eyes and say, why am I not using this technology? You know, one day I was uh, in plasma uh, research institution. I found out the plasma application in textiles, correct? Now I had gone to see what they are doing. Now they had no idea that that can be used in textiles. But when you go and see a new technology, you can suddenly find out, no, 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 this can solve my this problem. So what is relevant, what is not relevant, 
unless you are constantly looking at newer things unless you have uh, a group of very good strategic minds who are constantly exploring you have a real chance of getting you know obsolete or getting out of business so this is another learning i think i have talked enough about business and its dynamism um so if i have to say another learning life learning not not business learning but another learning is that i tell all the youngsters that do what where your passion is correct don't don't do what is uh, a recommended thing or what is the in thing or what makes lot of money do something which you are passionate about you are passionate about painting then become a great painter you are passionate about cooking then become a good cook uh, there is there is uh, i mean now anything and everything you get become a great dancer just one minute sorry just one minute. sorry for the interruption my dogs were impatient <laughs> so uh, so i am saying that uh, passion is what you should pursue uh, because then only excellence will come in so this is one of the things uh, i have learned um i think uh, you know today society gives lot of importance to money power and position i think they are all great things money helps you uh, protects you from a uh, uh, lot of things inconveniences correct but money beyond uh, a certain um, comfort level what you what you need for yourself is meaningless i mean it's it's just a it's just a number i mean it doesn't do anything to you um as far as prestige and position is concerned i think you never pursue these things you only you only pursue your passion and dream and the greatest human beings have a vision which is beyond themselves take any leader take vikram tata i mean he was born in a in a very very privileged household he could have just lived well correct but he had a vision and the vision was for a nation the vision was for for you know changing india so he worked for something which was bigger than life and that's why so many brilliant people joined him suppose he had said i want to make more money or i want to make sarabhai enterprises bigger than what it is okay i mean you will get a set of guys but when you say i want to take india into a space leadership now that's a very compelling all you guys some of the best minds in india are are with these institutions because of the compelling vision correct which is much beyond yourself people give their life for our flag why because a nation it is its freedom is bigger than yourself people are willing to give their life correct which is the most precious thing to a human being so for a cause which is bigger there is there is that you know uh, you 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 get lot of support and you get excellence out of that and then vikram kaka never looked for fame correct vikram kaka never looked for greatness he never looked for money he was wearing a simple kurta and a and a very simply dressed person living very very simply correct but everything came to him so it was a by product of his greatness of his vision so i think the important thing for all of us is that we have to give our life for something which is meaningful to the society and a larger cause it will give you immense pleasure it will take away all your stress correct it will give you the endurance and ability to fight against impossible odds because your dream is not for yourself it is for a cause 
it is going to benefit millions it is going to transform a society correct so suppose i say arvind through its uh, its um, uh, you know entire program is going to help hundreds of impoverished women to get jobs like garmenting so we are taking adivasi women after their ssc they come in they work with us for 4 years we help them do distant learning they work for 8 hours in our factory they earn around 5 lakhs or save 5 lakhs in 4 years they get a graduate degree they go back to their village now they are a graduate they have 5 lakhs of income right they get a different kind of marriage proposal because they are empowered women and now two people in the family are working husband and wife correct and they also learn the ability uh, 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 they become confident because of their degree and they are having earned 4 lakhs of rupees or 5 lakhs saved 5 lakhs of rupees now that family will come out of poverty correct and if arvind is creating this platform then it is much bigger than only making money for its shareholder which is our dharma because we are publicly listed but can we be a socially responsible company which is doing a lot of good through its activity then it gives a very different kind of meaning when i interview a person and when i give this vision i attract very different quality of people then say that let's create shareholders value so this is what i'm trying to say that your vision has to be compelling and if it is for broader good then you will be able to do something which will give you immense satisfaction to you humility and openness i have i have already stressed on it that if you are not humble and if you are not open what can happen to you what happened to me so i've shared with you uh broader good so can your business be of course the major dharma is to create shareholders value but can it be a socially responsible business then it would give you much more joy and energy and finally personally if you cannot spend at my age if i cannot share my learnings if i cannot support people if i cannot spend time mentoring people and if i cannot work for institutions like amdavad university or sept or atira or whichever it is uh, uh, without wanting anything in return so when you are in any public institution i think it is imperative that neither you want fame neither you want money neither you want power you are there to give yourself and whatever your abilities are you are not there with any expectation if you go into any public institution with personal expectation you will do harm to that institution so at a particular age i think it is imperative for every individual to give back everything not money it is the easiest thing to write a check it is the most difficult thing to give most of your time and your abilities and without any expectation so this is the greatest kind of joy a human being can have that when you are sharing and when you are wanting to give yourself away not only your money money is important money has to be given like my grandfather said 20% of whatever you earn has to be given to a proper cause without any expectations in return correct if you attach strings to whatever you are doing your money or your ability or your your capability it will it will it will get corrupted so i think it is very very important that you give all this without any expectation and it is difficult i know uh, in today's world but i can share with you that i am the 17th generation in my family correct my family started in 15000 and that it is a recorded history now why is it a recorded history the family has not kept the history the society has kept the history why did society keep the history because every generation worked for the society society has kept the history of those generations correct and we have all survived 
because we have lived a value based living and we have lived our lives as much as we can by sharing whatever we can i think this is the dharma and this has i don't want to sound uh, that i think i have benefited the maximum out of this correct because i am joyful against any adversity it gives me the power to sustain all the difficulties which all of us face because life is is full of difficulties you know you may health wealth external circumstances natural calamity i mean you name it covid correct again my entire empire was threatened again i had to bet everything i had uh, uh, gained but it gives you resilience it gives you resilience because finally you learned in life that you know you have to fight it and then you have to hope and you have to give your best and then let things work out you know there was a very nice nice saying ke jeetna and harna is a result but kaam karna is your dharma correct so i mean you have to take things in 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 in, in proper stride i mean you cannot predict outcomes but you can predict your effort you you have whatever is in your hand you can only be responsible for that and i don't think you should get very encouraged by success neither you should get very dejected by failure it's difficult to say this but i have personally experienced this i have personally gone from the height of success to the very bottom and come out of it not once many times and why because i have i have said ki nishkam karma karo gita hai kahu se ke bhai you do your best correct do not focus on the result because in any case result is not in your hand so why why focus so much on the result yes constantly question yourself what can you do to make the situation better that is all that you have in your hand so beyond that don't 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 get stressed out by by results because results are a outcome of lot of things as i have again explained in my short uh, speech so broadly i think i have taken up enough time and uh, i'll be very happy i think to end this because i can go on but i think i have overshot my time uh, so i'll be very happy for uh, you and me if there are any thank you uh... thank you thank you she sanjay lal bhai very inspiring journey and learnings for all especially for the youth and uh, and you and you stressed upon how to turn problems into opportunities and for this one needs original thinking and ideas uh, which can translate to success uh, but these can be sustained only if one is able to stand on always on his on his toes ready to change as you rightly uh, mentioned all through through your talk i was constantly um, reminded of the analogy or the relevance to our, our efforts that we do in to execute new and challenging projects scientific projects i think all your experiences and learnings will be directly applicable in all the fields thanks a lot for sharing the same i think i will now hand over to my colleague professor pallam raju for conducting the question and answer session thank you very much thank you thank you uh, sanjay bhai for this fascinating uh, informative uh, and inspiring talk you know walking us through right from your uh, early you know graduation days and the challenges you faced with the new with the, with the labor or with the new sick company that was given to you or uh, and then and then and the several challenges that are faced now from that time and this time with especially the business uh, you know the way things are growing and uh, i think you you put in you have seen lived through all these things and i think you have nicely shared your excitement and uh, and we are actually excited i'm actually spellbound to see several uh, you know uh, uh, several developments that have happened thank you for that sharing and i'm sure there are uh, there are several questions both by the panelists here and uh, and and also on the youtube 
so I'll, I'll maybe take you know a few of them uh, uh, from from YouTube and come back to our panel members. And one of the questions is uh, that I think nowadays we are all seeing, and this question is by Dr. Dibyan Chakraborty. Is he saying in business what is more important? Do the consumers know what products they want, or the company shows the consumers what they possibly want? Yeah, as I was saying that uh, consumers don't know what they want, but they, I mean, uh, both both things are important. Consumers know uh, that they want differentiation, they want a unique identity, they want immediate gratification. Just to give you an example on apparel, correct? But many a times, a company shows a new product. Like if you show the multiverse universe through AR or VR, Correct, which none of us have seen. Like, let's say Facebook is working on it. All these people are working on it. Now we may get hooked on to it. So it is both ways. I know when what I like broadly within the given framework, but I don't know. I cannot talk as a consumer about something which I'm not even aware of. So many a times today, companies come out with something which is so mind boggling that suddenly people start relating to it. So it is both ways. I would say both are, are uh, and I think as a related uh, overshoot of that point, you know, my point is how much does the advertising play a role in this? You know, uh, it, because it is all social model media. It is now endorsement. As you know now, you know the old way of advertising is gone. Uh, it is everything is through social media endorsements and bloggers and <laughs> specialists. Who are constantly talking about uh, your products? I think you know the younger generation uh, is is constantly touching base with their friends and colleagues and figuring out uh, what is good and what is bad. So social media is the is the medium, and there are now very newer ways of of reaching out or appealing to the consumer. And secondly, the amount of data which I have about each consumer is unparalleled and the amount of analytics I can do to understand your likes and dislikes is immense because of all the big data analytics uh, and all the technologies which are put to use. So for the first time, you know, when I open my uh, any any kind of, uh, you know, platform, the only things I like pop up, the only songs which I like to hear they pop up. They make the playlist specially for me because they know what kind of songs I'm hearing. So they know everything about me. I have I have no secrecy because they know exactly where I have gone, what I have done. They know everything about me. Unfortunately, there is nothing like privacy now. Yes. Yes. So I think the world has changed because they know you exactly. So now you have to give very tailor-made and no one has time to waste. Uh, uh, looking at because there is so much data that you can get confused. So very targeted advertising, exactly understanding you is now being done by everyone. Okay, thank you. There is next uh, question is by Dr. Sita. She is asking about your urban mills <laughs> materials were affordable in by middle class families earlier. How it has now become a company of uh, upper middle class. What was this part of the growth plan or is there any plan to have multi-pronged approach? No, it is a multi-pronged approach. See, our denim is going, if you really see in India, 75% of the denim is still in, with the unorganized sector. So my fabric is going to unorganized sector. So that pair of jeans at 499, which you are wearing, correct, from a local uh, entrepreneur, the fabric may be mine, correct? And the same um, uh, blouse material, which was being sold by my grandfather, Kasturbhai Lalbhai, we are still continuing with it. Correct? Now, because of inflation and all that, all the costs have moved up, but it is still servicing the same, same customer. It is the customer segmentation has not changed. So we are still servicing the mass customers and we also have premium products, but we have not become premiumized. We have brands. Uh, like flying machine is still a middle price point brand. And now we'll be launching Newport and Rough and Tough. Like I had a 299 pair of jeans. So now online, all these products at the 
uh, best price points uh, will be relaunched only on the online platform so we are in the in the mass segment also we are into bridge to uh, in the premium segment and bridge to luxury so we are we are straddling straddling through all the three segments okay thanks dr watts is asking you know uh, do you you know because you talked about the zero uh, discharge uh, kind of solution yes water uh, yes water so he's asking do you share these ideas of no industrial pollution with other industries on the contrary as a outcome because we became we set up this uh, zero discharge uh, way back in uh, 1994 so we were much be before uh, sustainability and all that came in correct and we learned a lot from this so we have created a water division which is a business now where we are giving these solutions to many companies including public sector companies and very large projects where we are doing their entire uh, zero discharge water man and it has become now statutory to have zero discharge so it has become a business the company is called envisol is a subsidiary of arvi okay okay thank you mohit uh, soni is asking how can we go about coupling indian industries with indian academy and how can the industries uh, generate the directed research uh, in this indian prospect i think it's a very good question you know see all our universe in ahmedabad university now we are doing project based learning so we are constantly asking uh, our companies to get engaged we take projects from companies and then multidisciplinary team solve these problems then we have summer placements and things like that so our students are constantly going to industry and while they are learning or graduating during their those four years undergrad uh, they are constantly in touch with industries so they are also understanding that the theory i am learning but it is all execution practice and and solving problems so how do you relate or how do you learn theory but how do you apply theory so everything is project based learning and there is a very very we encourage very close interaction with industry and uh, academics and all our faculty also we are saying that when you are doing cutting edge research correct please also uh, work with the outside industry to see that your patents or how do you commercialize them or how do you come up with your, how can your solutions uh, you know help the society or can work with industries or whatever you are depending on depending on your solution or your research because they may not be only for industry they may be for various causes so but relating to the outside world and making it applicable is the most important thing so this should be encouraged good institutions are already doing it is what i am saying there are many institutions doing it yeah professor vijay uh, sahu is asking Uh, it's uh, we realize uh, failure easily than success also failure and success are just relative things so how can one try to change oneself if he or she does not realize about his or her own success to be more philosophical also <laughs> i didn't really get the exact question but as i'm saying that neither of that should uh, you should get carried away with it but you see to fail uh is not an end objective ever because failure also leads to poor outcomes so you want to constantly succeed but you have to learn that you can never completely succeed you know uh, and when you are wanting to innovate or when you want to think out of box you have to be willing to fail many a times come up with a successful formula and then win i mean it will be uh, i have never seen and statistically also it is not possible that when you try 10 things all 10 things work however much preparation or however good thinking may have gone behind it it is impossible you can improve your chances of statistically you can improve your success chances but you can never guarantee success so you have to learn and i think you have to quickly learn quickly change what is not working and and try and and, and adapt and do things which work so this is how i will i will say but i didn't really get the question uh, if it is a philosophical question i i have said that you should not get personally carried away by success or failure you should be resilient if you fail you shouldn't give up 
you should have a never die attitude but you should learn from failure you should not keep on wasting time energy money resources on failed ideas you should quickly change and do something different <clears throat> yes abhijay adaral is asking is it possible that a businessman could manipulate can commoners thoughts or demands in order to book profit from his or her products very big danger money corrupts and power corrupts more <laughs> uh, so yes and big data and 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 if you really ask me we are bombarded by so much of pointed as i was saying the bad thing about it is without knowing it we are constantly getting influenced by all the communication we are re receiving and this is all for profit so it's a real danger and there are lots of debates about uh, uh, you know privacy and and and, and how much of of uh, kind of uh, manipulation in our thoughts in our thinking in our uh, desires is being manipulated by by business for profit but i would say that business is always going to do this I think we'll have to become more aware. We yes. can't can't blame the other person all all the time. I have learned in my life when something doesn't work, blame yourself first. Because <laughs> when you point one finger at someone, four four fingers are pointing at you. Please remember that. Like I'm I'm saying this, I'm pointing at you, but four fingers are pointing at me. So whenever something is going wrong, first please blame yourself. Then you say big business is doing this. This guy is doing this. Yes, he is doing it. But why are you allowing it? <laughs> But they will, they will. Answer is yes. Okay. Uh, Mohit Sun is asking, how can as one as an individual, you know, from your experience, come out of the play too? And probably you have explained, based on your uh, uh, several ups and downs, that you have come up out of the play too, and <laughs> you alluded to that actually. this is what i'm saying i think the important thing is quickly learn from your failure accept it see first first step is acceptance if you do not accept that you have made a mistake or these things have if you are in denial like all these textile companies were in denial that no 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 government will help us and we will get saved now you are in a denial of a reality so acceptance is the first thing then understanding Uh, as to why things are not working resilience fighting it quickly coming out with what will work and then pursuing it relentlessly i'm not saying it will always work but these are the traits you need to have and um, i think this is uh, from vijaya sahu i think this is definitely philosophical according to you what is more powerful dharma or karma and also what is actual difference between them dharma and karma dharma by which you mean uh, following uh, what has been told by us in dharma is is your personal uh, responsibility if you take dharma philosoph i mean religiously or in a way uh, i think and karma is action correct karma is what have we have been talking about and i would describe dharma as more like value based that your dharma is 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 sticking to the values not uh, so as i have said that if you are working on issues uh, and your vision is not to uh, or or to to in a whichever personal way help society at large or 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 a bigger goal then your karma and karma both will be very different then if you are working in a very selfish way to only personally gain I, I, from whatever i would say okay, i would relate it like this so i have said it already that if you have a bigger vision and not a personal vision of power money and fame like like all great people take anyone uh, from gandhi ji to vikram kaka i mean take anyone they have all selflessly worked for a bigger objective and they have been remembered you know a very rich man or a very powerful man is not going to be remembered yes but we are not here to get remembered but we are when we are living 
we want that that joy of living and that joy of living comes by giving yourself completely it cannot come from material uh, i'm not saying for one minute that remain poor impoverished <laughs> have enough money so that the, the you are protected from all the vagaries of the world but cannot work your entire life or that cannot be your end objective it, it is not fulfilling you have a bigger car you suddenly someone will have better car you will again get jealous you will try and get that car then someone will have a bigger plane someone will have a bigger 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 so there is no end to that that can never give you joy but if you can put a smile on one face in a day you will just see when you are going to sleep what will happen in your heart correct yes by buying that mercedes it's not going to happen it will one minute you will be very happy but then you will suddenly see your neighbor having a bigger mercedes and that the same mercedes is is going to become meaningless to you but that smile which you have put on someone else's face is is there correct and that joy is there and that guy said thank thank you correct that that is that is that is yours that cannot be replicated by our neighbor right correct yes. he has to work for it and you would be happy if he also works for it you are not going to compete with him correct you will say come come let us both work and make more smiles so it is yes. it is it is a it is a nice thing that is the only way uh, life has any meaning otherwise life has no meaning we are all passengers we can't own anything everything is virtual we are talking about metascape a uh, metaverse but this is also this physical world is also as you know in quantum science you know that it's, it's 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 virtual i mean we have all come together we'll we'll disintegrate and we are transient so what is there in this life except fulfillment and everyday joy when you go to sleep you should feel joyful and you should feel that you know they, this day has been meaningful that's it yeah nothing else matters yes thank you i think uh, there are uh, no more uh, uh, you know first maybe i'll take some questions from the panel members before going back to youtube so if there are any uh, you know questions from the panel members probably can take yep. yeah probably we'll uh, start with dr bharadwaj it's i saw his hand raised first then maybe yes, thank you questions. thank you pallam and uh, really it was uh, intellectually very valuable and touching different facets of life uh, which sanjay bhai has lived through and uh, uh, constantly reminding us that change is constant but uh, it reminds me that change is unchangeable right so, so i would put it that way uh, i want to ask you about uh, uh, this uh, new things which you are trying to bring up in the textile industry right you talked of uh, certain things uh, in certain ways but uh, more direct questions to you now is in textile industry now mm. what things which you as a arvind mills limited is going to bring yeah. up as i am saying that smart textiles is one big concept we are working on because this whole problem of all brands is that they are buying 6 months in advance and then let's say my brand tommy hill figure i buy for the next season now and i will have full price sell throughs of only 60 65% the best managed brands then the rest of 35% goes for end of the season sales as you know you know we all have end of the season sales everything is discounted so this is a very big problem to buy something well in advance and then have certain products not moving out if you can change this supply chain uh, supply chain and produce only what sells it will change the paradigm of the entire industry and it will be very gratifying for the end consumers so how do you and with dig digitization digital technology with technologies where you put yarn and you get the garment on the other side so there are newer technologies coming now so this is what is required and we are forefronting the we are going to customers and making them familiar that i can do this for you right because people are not familiar so we are going with these solutions 
and making the our buyers which are brands aware that i can do this for you you put all these products online you will immediately get uh, to know which products are selling not selling and i'll supply just in time so this is one of the biggest change i'm trying to do i don't know whether i'll succeed or not okay just uh, one more question kalam yes uh, we know that uh, you are called as the denim king of india you know because it all started uh, but uh, what new changes is expected in denim in future as i was saying uh, the denim king doesn't matter to me at all i'm very happy that this has become the denim capital of the world so ahmedabad after arvind having started denim here it has become the denim capital uh, the largest amount of denim is produced now back in ahmedabad so we had 76 mills at that time we have almost 25 30 denim mills here now so i'm very happy that i did the beginning and so many people have been recruited and the whole ecosystem is going now to come to your question answer a uh, question the major change as i'm saying is that the dyeing process involves a lot of water now we are doing waterless dyeing so that is going to be the major change uh, which is coming and we will again use this technology to do smart textiles so just in time and how do we how do we uh, you know cut down this lead time so these major two changes i see coming into denim also yes. okay great thank you thank you yes uh, yes professor yeah, pallam can i ask the question yeah professor desh pandey go ahead yeah yeah thank you sanjay bhai for your uh, time and very interesting uh, lecture i have three questions one is uh, historical in nature another is philosophical and third one is financial so first right. is uh, you know lal bhai family is known for its value based living and also philanthropy social justice uh, nationalist and patriotism when if you look at the history foundation of saraspur mill and then the arvin mill was founded because gandhi ji said kasur bhai that please do something for swadeshi yeah. now yeah. my question is that how did these virtues imbibed in the family i know mavlankar ji and uh, sardar vallabh bhai patel were closely associated with kasur bhai but they are nationalistic spiritual wise or how all these things uh, you know came into the family it just sustained for generations see one major factor i would say is that we have always lived together so i was fortunate enough to be born in this family and that for 25 years i stayed with kasur bhai lal bhai in the same house so me my father my mother my sister and uh, dada ji were staying under one roof now the biggest learning is when you live with a person like him correct for 25 years you are learning every day these values and values are what values is what one person practices otherwise values are just notional concepts correct right? so when you live with someone you see someone living those values like dada ji will say if you come one minute late that means you are not valuing the time of other person that is arrogance now this has got ingrained in me correct right? then he will say that if you keep a light open a light on and come out and you are wasting energy of the nation that's a waste correct right? now this is ingrained so how to use resources correct right? how to value people's time then he would say that if you want to know the quality of a human being just see when he is talking to his domestic help does he have the same humility to talk to a domestic help when he is talking to a prime minister or when he is talking to a domestic help does he have the same courtesy that will show you the character of the of the person correct he used to have only eight long kurtas and he used to number them because they will go for washes equally correct and then he will know that the fifth fifth uh, uh, jabba got torn with the same number of washes so he will call and he will track it down to the loom and you know so a blockchain like we are today talking about traceability through blockchain He used to track it at that time, correct? So now 
now blockchain and what my grandfather did it is imbibed in me you know yeah. those values of simplicity constantly doing things for he never had he was uh, his office was open right. no secretary from from prime minister to worker could walk into his office without uh, without appointment no appointments were given and he had only one chair in front of him he didn't like people sitting in front of him because he would give them an answer in one minute he valued his time he only told me that that i am i am most patient and i hear professors talk about it for two, two hours and i don't talk <laughs> because that's an institution where debate should be allowed correct but everywhere else he would just take one minute to answer now all this what i'm trying to say is how can you forget this this has become me now this this is part of who i am because i have lived with with my grandfather my father they were all this now my father has told me i am staying on a campus where i have four buildings correct when my father passed away in 2014 he said i have two sons two daughter in law three grandchildren so he said all of you stay in one house tell your grandchildren go to college so we are nine of us staying in one house though we have four houses <laughs> now all these interactions the way they have happened with my grandfather i am having it with my grandchildren now this has the highest probability that this will continue uh, there are no guarantees in life please please uh, i am not trying to but if you are asking me how this happens this happens because we are all practicing this every day the way i talk to my my domestic help they are like my family i have seen vikram kaka talk to my domestic help no huh? i have seen that and i have seen the warmth he had and the amount of inquiry he had for them so i have seen all this correct i was privileged right. enough to see this mm -hmm. so then it has become part of me i i cannot be anything else i can't be anything else mm -hmm. so this is the answer to that huh? fine thank you very much my second question is about the narottam lal bhai research center uh, i think yes. it was uh, it was institutionalized in 1973 So my yes. question is that uh, in 1973, when Narottam Lal Bai Research Center was formed, at that time Atira was already there. So yes. in terms of research, uh, what were the difference? What uh, made Lal Bai uh, family to set up this center for research? See, Atira was doing more diagnostic and testing and those kind of services which were required for the entire industry. But when you want to innovate, correct? usually you would not take it to a common institution because of ipr and very and you need a very dedicated team like smart textiles i can't i am working with number of universities and number of brilliant people but i will not take it to an institution usually because they don't have and they will not have so many various disciplines coming together to solve a very unique problem but for lot of common services atira is the platform so there are different needs and requirements okay fine thank you and my last question and very important question is related to funding and policies you know uh, a debate is there that whether uh, self finance institutes uh, are better or the education institute should be all run by government so self finance institutions have larger fees but they provide much better infrastructures and much better facilities so so the question is that uh, how do one balance uh, for generating the fund whether the researchers or students should be left only for doing research they should not be bothered uh, with you know generating funds and the government should provide the funds or it should be the responsibility of generating the fund also So, so it's an education institute versus research institutes. So role of self finance versus government finance. I would answer like this: uh, If you see some of the great institutions all over the world, correct? Uh, the alums have given huge donations and created a corpus, correct? Mm -hmm. So all these Harvard, Yale, which have existed for six hundred years or more, they have billions of dollars as corpus. from that corpus and the interest which they earn on it all infrastructure and everything happens fees is basically to take the 
uh, is to break even with the operating cost of faculty and all those things. Fees should be never a source of income, correct? All the infrastructure and all that has to be built through a corpus and income of the corpus. And whatever fees you are charging, as, as long as you have a need blind policy, what do I mean by need blind policy? That every deserving student for want of money will not be precluded from this education. So in Ahmedabad University, on the merits, as soon as a family's income is less than 8 lakhs, we waive the tuition fees. So no deserving student for want of money is precluded from this education. Correct? Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't have resources, if you are not going to attract the best minds, if you are not going to build the world-class lab laboratories, correct? And if you are not going to attract the best PhDs and master students, you will have to give stipend also to PhDs, correct? Yes. So, I mean, yeah. all these funds will be required to do cutting edge research. And who should teach? The best mind should teach. And who are the best minds who are creating knowledge, not only dissipating knowledge? Mm -hmm. I like to be taught by creators and not people who are just reciting what is already known. What is already known is everywhere now. And a brilliant student doesn't have to learn it, you know. He has to learn what he can do with this knowledge. Now, this requires resources. So I would say uh, self-finance and all that is not really important. Any institution, I don't like making money out of education. Correct? So not for profit, as long as it is not for profit. Then every deserving student should get not only waive the tuition fees, we go out, we go to his home. If we think he doesn't have resources, he's brilliant. We give him computers, we give him books. We give him whatever is required, but we attract him to the university because the fascinating mind is he's going to add to the brand of Ahmedabad University, mm -hmm. right? And he's required to create knowledge. We are creators of knowledge. We are not only imparting knowledge. And for these resources are coming from the corpus and executive programs. So executive programs, we charge the fees. All the basic courses, undergrad, masters, should be at cost break even. Mm -hmm. They should never make money. Mm -hmm. So this is the philosophy. And this mm -hmm. philosophy is being followed by all best institutions in the world. So I would not differentiate between government and... But yes, education is a fundamental right. And it should be made available to everyone. If you want to really, you know, reduce the... the, the in, um, the kind of, uh, if you want everyone to come up, education is a fundamental need or, or right of every person. Mm -hmm. So it should be made available and the best quality of education should be made available. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, these very good schools only take the final best percentile of people. So what happens to the rest of them? Correct. Mm -hmm. it, 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 yes, but the, 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 the remedial courses institutions which are which are which are teaching to everyone but if you want to build a research oriented brilliant institution it will have the best teachers and it will have the best students mm -hmm. and it will get into that virtuous cycle mm -hmm. and then you cannot do anything else but meritocracy mm -hmm. that problem is there now you can't say i'll take the bottom five percentile and still uh, do cutting edge research. That's not possible. Possibly with technology, we'll change and put a chip in the mind and everyone will become equal. I don't know. But as of now, there is inequality in the amount of intelligence or capability an individual has. Sure. So this would be the way we would, I would recommend every great institution to, to run. And we, mm -hmm. at least in our family, we have never run um, an institution for profit. Right. They are all for charity and every rupee counts. Right. right. So same thing, same logic will also apply to research institutes also. So research institutes, uh, uh, you know, when they begin to generate their own resources, they would be more competitive and more flourishing. Uh, this is what your vision tells. Yeah, like Atira should have the best uh, research, uh, scientists uh, working on cutting edge research, come out with these solutions and 
uh, uh, then uh, uh, commercialize it and from the income of that keep on uh, building better and better uh, 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 you know disciplines and people and it's all all about scientists and doing research applied research then you can do nice. other research also but they, you have to have resources fundamental mm -hmm. research will have to have resources but applied research has to be done of the best uh, type to really make a difference to the industry mm -hmm. right thank you very much thank you very much thank you for spending your time for thanks all right sir any more questions from the panel members uh, alam raju may i yes please nandita yeah i had a question regarding uh, are you considering uh, banana fiber to make the jeans like some attempts have been made recently um although i am aware that uh, banana fiber jeans becomes expensive uh, when, when yes we have made it banana fiber is a very nice handle like silk and uh, it imparts uh, more than jeans it will go for all women's wear and all those finer fabrics but we should keep on developing it so that the cost become more rational. rational so all this hemp all this there is a whole trend because you know even cotton is not very sustainable so only organic cotton is sustainable otherwise it is a very polluting crop it use, yeah. uses huge amount of water uh, pesticides insecticides so we we have to first change the way cotton is and no gm modified genes uh, original yeah. basic genes so we are changing the way cotton should be done so all natural fibers which are more sustainable how to bring the cost down and how to uh, do everything uh, in a way which is more sustainable even polyester man made fiber how do we completely recycle it just yeah. now we are they are not degradable and we are dumping it in the earth so there are a lot of startups which are trying to again get fiber back from a used sportswear garment so uh, it will it will all get recycled so this recycled. Is, these are all the cutting edge research is happening in textiles this is the next ge next generation next of generation. Things which will have to come in everything and natural fibers are definitely going to to be required more and more or even if man made then they will have to be recycled so they don't use or pollute or they are more sustainable thank you very much any more questions from uh, the panel uh, members can i ask one question uh, sure. yes uh, yes go ahead yeah so uh, my, my question is regarding a thing that uh, we know that the technology is moving forward and then with the consumers their data is available to the companies so but there's a lot of personal uh, you already mentioned that the lies they are not private anymore there's no privacy so is there a line to be drawn there or if the, if yes then where is that line that can be drawn it's a difficult question huh? to be very honest i don't know because see uh, we can stop this data um, uh, i mean the servers can be uh, I mean, we are trying to bring them onshoring of servers. I mean, it's basically trying to have more control over data. Uh, but where do you draw the line? Because we are all navigating that data goes back to to every every service provider. Um, I don't know what is the what is the. Uh, I would say the responsibility is also mine that um, to an extent that. Uh, Am I doing anything which I want to keep it to myself? What am I doing that I am so afraid of sharing? Basically, a lot of people ask that all this, wherever you are surfing and whatever you are doing, it's going back to. But I said, I don't mind because they will feed me with what I like. So if you ask me about privacy, I was asking this question to me. Okay, where I where do I have a problem? I don't have a problem. Let them have that data <laughs> because I'm not doing anything which is which I don't I I I I, I, I mind sharing. I think you know your location or if, I mean your personal safety or but I mean if you are afraid of someone uh, gunning you down, yes, I mean that, 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 but I'm not afraid. <laughs> I think I'm 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 okay. That uh, if someone wants to gun me down, I'll get gunned down. What else? <laughs> Whether I'll keep my GPS on or not and not get that, I, mean, I don't know. 
it's, it's a personal choice. Then I have to switch off my phone. But I mean, or you have to be, you have to say that, you know, you always have those negatives. I mean, so I mean, a whole, whole lot of people know where I am. But it doesn't bother me, to be very honest. I think it's more on the personal side. Personal side, which one, which data you would not like the big companies to know? Yeah, no, I understand that it is a difficult area. They yeah, are so certain. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we have to then decide okay, these things definitely. Uh, like you know, my, but now I don't share anything about my family on Facebook. Now, if I share things on Facebook, correct, and then say, "Hey, yeah, data public ho gaya. Now, why are you doing this? Then I mean, don't. Yeah. Huh? I mean, for personal lives you don't want to reveal, you know, but then you are saying you are sharing it with your friend, but I mean, you know, all data is, is, is going to, is, 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 cannot be kept private. So, I mean, it, these are difficult questions to be very honest, but it requires a completely a different debate and I have really not applied my, I'm just, I was just asking myself what data I don't want. So I have stopped doing those activities. Like I don't put my families or my anything personal. If you see my Facebook page, it will only have flowers. It will not have anything to do with me. So, I mean, then, then I'm fine. I mean, I don't want to share uh, uh, with everyone, you know, or, or even a larger group uh, about uh, my personal activities. So, I mean, that's your personal choice. And that much, then discipline you will have to have what to do, what not to do. This is my answer. I may, I may, I may not have given up because I haven't really thought beyond this. So I don't have an answer, to be honest. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Shall I? Other question? Yes, Durga Prasad. Yeah. Sir, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first question uh, takes me back to my childhood when I first heard of stone wash. Uh, yeah. So I had to wait almost for uh, five years to get one at that time oh, oh. because i was a kid that size was not available so right. that my question is that how actually you got the idea of this stone wash rather than the no, 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 i didn't thing. get the idea of stone wash stone wash came up in the world it became a big rage as a result denim became very popular and as a result arvin benefited i didn't think of stone wash okay. it was not my idea at all okay so it was stone the wash happened Stone wash, someone in Italy or America, I don't even know who did the first stone wash, but it became a rage because all these rock stars and Bollywood, Hollywood, Hollywood actors and all started wearing it. It became a rage. Everyone loved it. So, I mean, denim benefited because of that. And I was at that time only I had started making denim. So I benefited. Okay. And my second question is actually, it is a very encouraging and inspiring lecture. Uh, my question is that you have started from denim ups and downs and you also touched the latest data analytics and artificial intelligence. In this entire journey, what do you think would be the next? I don't know, but I'm always learning. I'm now looking at multiverse and I'm saying, will I have to dress people virtually? So I don't know, but I'm trying to find out because I read this on Facebook. Okay, he's creating... He's renamed it as multiverse and he's creating now I'll, I'll I'll so I'll put my best minds to this that in multiverse what can Arvind do <laughs> so that could be in a, in a virtual world in a digital world how do I do apparel clothing and sell it I mean I don't know so, so just tell you how I'm thinking correct you have to be constantly if, 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 if there are so many new ideas coming so you try and explore as to what would you do and where is there a is there an opportunity but to say what i'll do next as i'm telling you just now i'm doing smart textile will i do multiverse and start dressing people virtually because i can give you a unique thing which will be only your thing virtually in your avatar correct yes you may want to dress up your avatar in a, so i will I, then you come to me i'll i'll give you that for a cost <laughs> i don't know so, see, these things will happen now. I mean, the world will keep on changing. Thank you, sir. Yeah, there was there was one curious question in uh, in the Facebook, I'm sorry, in the chat box, saying, you know, how come all your company starts with the name A? 
Um, Dadaji did that. So I have no, I'm just following what a great person did. I have no views on it. Sometimes you don't use your brains. <laughs> you just follow. <laughs> so there but is, there um, is nothing, no, 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 no real thinking in it. I mean, we've been doing it. We've been doing it yes. for so many years. And it's not that, I mean, Dadaji had Nutan. Saraspur, he inherited. There were two mills started by Lalbai, his father. And he passed away and Dadaji had to join business at the age of 16. And he had to, then he created the whole group. And then most of his company, which he started, were with the Navy. Okay, I think uh, I think we have almost covered uh, several you know, questions uh, in chat box and also in the panel. Uh, if I may, uh, I would like to ask one question. And uh, that is regarding the data analytics and all, you know, so much of flooding of information that uh, you at Arvind will be receiving uh, in terms of uh, people's choices and the new trends and all. But uh, coming up with a design, you know, uh, what goes into, how do you choose to make, because there can be several possibilities, you know, combinations that will be coming up. So how do you come up with a design? Is it a gut feeling or, or you know, few people say that, you know, maybe this is a wisdom or, you know, or... or uh, no, it is it is big data and data analytics and analysts uh, uh, are at, uh, data analysts are telling you exactly what trends. So like checks are selling very much just now. These colors, these things, big checks, small checks. So it's all data, 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 data. So then around that, then you you create a collection. And now if I'm going to go into smart textiles, I would have that big data. On that, I will digitize things. I will put them up online and whatever sells i'll just make it in time so there will be no guesswork there will be all 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 analytics and all led by uh, by uh, only data 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 yes. thank you so less and less of creativity and more and more. this is what is going to happen that some uh, brilliant designer is not going to tell me what i wear yeah. it is big data which is going to tell uh, what my customers preferences are and around that the designers will be asked to design yes. so it's all changing it's changing yes sir. yeah yeah i think yes sanjay bhai it's really you know pleasure actually in, in addition to several questions that were there in the chat box there are several uh, appreciations of that of the of your talk i'm just going through some of the chat uh, you know people are you know all the audience who have been following up in our youtube are thoroughly impressed and uh, have you know conveyed their uh, you know, appreciation. Uh, they like this talk, so I would like to, on behalf of them, also convey to you that uh, your uh, talk has been truly inspiring. You know because it is coming out with personal experiences because you are not narrating a story; you are narrating your story, and uh, wherein you have uh, seen several you know ups and downs, and you have come up, come out, and uh, as you also admitted, there were some issues, but. By admitting, you became you know more wider, you know acceptable. Uh, increased, and I think uh, I think you you showed us the way how to uh, how to live as a as a as a professional and as a as a as a human being. I would like to you know uh, thank you on behalf of all the people both on attending on the webex in this panel and also on the YouTube, and uh, and on my behalf also I'd like to thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, I will now um, uh, hand it over to Dr. Bhujit Vaishnav. Uh, yeah, it was a fascinating and roller coaster ride, rather, I will say, to summarize, uh, and multi layered talk, which had every component for every listener in this, uh, you know, stressed time of COVID and various other things going around. And I'm sure there is something uh, take home for every listener of this talk especially a very clear and loud message that change is inevitable and uh, innovation is the key to success, which was also emphasized by Dr. Vikram Sarabhai way back in uh, 60s through his concept of horizontal control management. Uh, we once again thank you uh, Sanjay Ralwaiji for his valuable time. In fact, I would uh, like to share that this was the longest talk in this uh, series so far. 
and that itself uh, speaks I'm about, sorry about the, that. No, sir. Uh, this is, uh, you know, speaking about the interest it has generated to the viewers and the kind of discussion and, you know, and your patient hearing of all the questions and also a very elaborate answers. Uh, we once again thank you for sparing your valuable time for this uh, talk on the eve of PRL's uh, 75th Foundation Day. We thank our director, Pro uh, Dr. Anil Bhardwaj, for having you here and uh, giving us this opportunity to listen to you. Uh, we thank uh, the committee members of PRL Ka Amrit Vyakhyan. Uh, we thank Professor Pallam Raju for conducting this uh, session. We thank all our viewers on this WebEx as well as YouTube uh, channel. And with this, we come to an uh, you know, end of this week's uh, Vyakhyan. And next week, we'll again join with new talk and new topic. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I